Welcome everybody to this Cluding webinar on augmented data quality empowering the professional services sector. Um, welcome everybody. Um, so today, um, Samuel, I'll be your main host, um, navigating and coordinating the webinar today. Um, Samuel Dasaolu, I'm one of the account executives here at Cluding, looking after the professional services sector and a few other sectors, and will be your main point of contact if and when you choose to get in touch. Um, joining me today, we have Aaron and Tim. Aaron is a specialist from Microsoft that will be going through a little bit <clears throat> of details around um, the data quality issues that we see within the professional um, services sector and how that's kind of shifted over time and how, um, what makes really, what makes it augmented, right? What are some of the changes that um, come from Cluden, from Microsoft that really helping accelerate some of the data um, challenges that are currently being faced within the industry at the moment. And then we'll be able to dive into a demonstration by Tim. Tim Ward is our CEO here at Cluden and he'll be able to run you through a, a scenario that we've put together and um, be able to walk you through a demonstration of how Cluden is able to tackle some some of those issues. Um, as I've just done that, so this is just a quick recap of the agenda that we're going to be going through. Like I mentioned, um, just a quick round of introduction, introducing everybody on the session today. Um, and then I'll be able to give you a quick overview of just to better understand who Cluedin is, who we are within the market from an MDM perspective, how it relates to data quality, and then passing over to Aaron and then for the demonstration from Tim as well. And all throughout the this session today, please feel free to um, input your questions. We'll be able to either directly um, pause and stop and um, ask the question again, I'll facilitate those. Or if um, we don't have any time um, towards the end, we'll be able to definitely get back to the individuals that's asked the questions and make sure that those um, answers are spread out accordingly. Perfect. So where we just want to get started is just a little bit of a background and introduction to Cluding, who we are and um, what, what, what our real USP is within the market. So um, Cluding um, has taken the parts of MDM that is um, hard to implement that typically takes um, three months. Um, it's just not simple. It's just not fast. And typically when people mention MDM, there's this little shutter of uh, what is that? And it's not mobile <laughs> data management is master data management. And we say we're a modern um, data management organization for a few different reasons, because we do away with the upfront um, data modeling aspect of your um, MDM process. So you don't have to do that. There's still modeling as part of the process. However, this is a part that allows you to iteratively bring your data in to the Cluding platform and model it um, is and when. Again, you can imagine the flexibility that gives you within the organization to not to be limited to one single domain, because we know, especially when we're talking with professional services, you have your contractors, you have your sites, you have your projects, you have your qualification, and they're all intertwined in different ways. And all these different data is coming from all different types of um, vendors and sources and systems. And you need to figure out a way whether you're trying to come up with a single view and different ways of stitching that data together. And it can be very, very hard when you have to do that up from data modeling. So there's a few different aspects um, that you can see there on the screen in terms of what makes us a little bit different. Um, our partnership and integration with Microsoft in terms of making it very easy to actually get started. Um, the not just the installation, but implementation phase. Um, we're typically doing that and getting results um, and um, actual value back to our customers within six weeks. It takes only about 15 minutes to actually be able to install through the Azure Marketplace. And I'll mention that a little bit um, later on as well. So the few different aspects of the Cluding platform that makes us unique, um, but is that upfront data modeling, um, no upfront data modeling, and also our integration with the Azure Open AI, which again is giving you the capability capabilities and ability to be able to um, not having to use the um, Azure Open AI for your data quality issues. Again, we'll see some of that within the demonstration later to be able to call upon third party like Dun & Bradstreet, Google Maps to be able to enrich your data in different ways, right? Or normalize and standardize things like addresses, phone numbers, um, uh, postcode, zip codes, wherever you are within the organization, to, um, within the world, to be able to standardize that. But then also we know that these um, large language models have a huge, huge um, um, capabilities to be able to not just understand 
what you're showing it within the data set, but then also be able to plug into um, the internet. So for example, being able to understand and normalize um, SAP data, for example, because I, for example, don't know, I can't understand all the different um, German acronyms and the, and the different um, wordings of this. But again, these um, large language models can understand that and normalize and actually know that this German word means first name and last name and so much more. But just from this is a, 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 a graph that you guys probably see quite often and ultimately showing that how cluding actually works in terms of connecting, cleaning and consuming your data. So cluding starts by being very um, data agnostic, right, regardless of where your data sits, whether it's on premise, in the cloud, in your data warehouse, your data lake, cluding allows you to plug into wherever your data sits within the organization, pull it into the Cluding platform where you're now doing your deduplication, your merging of your data, your matching, your merging um, of your data, right? Again, to be able to give you that standardized view across the whole organization, right? Um, and you can also create that stream without having to worry about, is my data clean first? Create that whole stream of where your data is sitting. Again, it could be from pulling it from your purview into the Cluding and pushing to your Power BI for reporting and dashboard, and then do all all the normalization, the cleansing, the enrichment I talked about with third party um, apps and so much more, and also all um, coupled on with the governance, catalog and lineage all throughout the process. But I know I don't want to talk too much about just the cluding, but I just wanted everyone to have a high level understanding of who cluding actually is, where we sit in the market, and also just really lastly before I pass over to Aaron, um, we'll just a few quotes that we have from our customers and one of the amazing things they're able to do with Azure OpenAI. So for someone like myself that's not technical, um, cluding will give me the ability to be again able to do standardization of zip code and phone number, things like that can be hard coded, but I know from people that have, have tried and are able to do it and they can do it. However, being able to just type in using natural language, can you highlight to me every zip code that's not within the UK standard, right? Again, that would that can be coded, but very easily being able to type that in using natural language is incredibly powerful and giving power into the hands of the actual business user that understand the data, that understand the differences between, I was looking at a data set the other day and it said leads and lead. And it's like, to to these, um, these uh, to a programming language or a code, it might um, get that modeled up, but someone that actually understand the difference that there's only one Leeds. There is a very small village in uh, in England called Leeds, but it's actually not spelled the way it's supposed to be spelled. And those um, little nuances that you want the power to be with the business users to be able to actually start um, working with the data, normalizing it before pushing it back to downstream consumers. Uh, but yeah, that's just a little bit of our uh, um, cluding at a high level. And I'll just pass over to Aaron to talk a little bit more about some of the data challenges that we see within the space. Uh, thanks, Sam. So um, I think some people on the call or listening back will probably know me. So that, that that's good. For those who don't, a um, bit of background. I've been master data management and DQ specialist with a sprinkled with, with a bit of data governance. Uh, for a while working at companies like Informatica and IBM. So <clears throat> as much as these seem like quite generic problems that are faced when, when data quality is poor, they're quite true. Um, and we can get into the finite detail of what those look like, but this is just a statement, right? We understand this. High level, poor data quality does affect operational efficiency. And within that, there's, multi there's like a hierarchy of things it affects, right? So that's just an open statement of, look, I've seen this for years. It, it, it's not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Um, if you can move to the next slide, Sam, that'd be, that'd be great. <clears throat> um, so I've kind of looked at this as, as what I'm seeing in the market and some of the prohibitors right, around some of the things that people want to do. So I, I'm looking at it in sort of two, two ways. Um, number one, quite simply, is we can't actually do these things. right? We don't have the bandwidth to execute these AI and ML use cases that our business is now asking for. And the truth is these questions and queries and, and demands from the business are now coming a lot more rapidly than they were before. And that's nicely because of the release of new technology, some of the stuff that's happening within Fabric and the, the ability to execute. But fundamentally, if I look at a couple of the projects that I've been involved in over the recent years, even stuff, stuff today, um, projects that can go on for a few months, most of that time is fixing data, right? And the thing is that will be done tactically for that particular use case. If we do it in a different way and we do it in a centralized way, 
we can then tackle that data, which then can be potentially used for another three or four use cases or part of that data. So we're looking at in terms of ability to execute the opportunity cost that fits within that, right? We can do one of these. Well, actually, if we put a bit of foundational work in place, we can do three or four within a year, five within a year, and we can be quite agile if our data is ready. Um, if we look at the fact that, okay, so the opportunity cost of not being able to do them versus sort of the, the cost that is implied by the actual cost cost of doing them. So if we go back to the, the whole thing of it's a couple of months to tidy up your data, yeah, that means that do you have enough team to support doing that? That is a cost. Is there a third party contractor coming in? And again, I've worked with uh, partners that have come in and spent a good month or two fixing data before they can do things that are incredibly impactful. And if we relate that to sort of the, the golden thread throughout the sort of professional services world, we want to understand how we're performing against our KPIs within a contract before we get to the point of crisis. We also want to understand um, which ones we can fix in time. So if we look at a triage process, so those are things that we're missing out on. Now, we know for anyone that's been involved in just those two use cases, not all of them, not being able to do that results in multi-million pound fines, right? Um, if we look at the golden thread within the construction world, not just sort of those sort of FM style or legal use cases, those can, those can be significant. And then without even knowing it, we're messing around with data or not having it ready to fix things like GDPR. But I'll kind of stop there, right? I'm just pointing out the obvious, but hopefully bringing it home into, you know, if, we, if we're ready with stuff, we can do lots of cool stuff with it, right? That is, is very impactful. Um, before I just hand over to Tim, we chat for some time around how the demo should look, right? And I got quite excited by what was cap what what Cluding was capable of. So I looked at we looked at multiple d domains and stringing them together, right? All incre incredibly powerful. So we can master it. We can do things. We can enhance the data quality. But we can actually start stringing multiple data domains together. So we can look at the impacts and the causal effect of different data domains across those domains, right? Now, obviously, we're kind of stretched for time, so we can't do like a two-hour presentation. But just so you know, what we're showing is part of what we discussed. Okay, there's a lot more that Cluding can do, and that's me as a third party saying I've seen it. Okay, sorry, Tim, I, I might have gone over time, but I'm, I'm about on. So anyway, over to you. Thank you. You're all good, mate. So thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Sam. Um, so um, thank you all for being here. I'll just echo that myself. Uh, let me share my screen, but also let me introduce myself. Similar to Aaron. Um, I've spent the last few years working in data quality and MDM, and um, I think that's allowed people like Aaron and myself to build up this level of scar tissue and experience that it kind of feels like we've seen like the, the spectrum of what's available. Um, I would say Aaron and I have both aged immensely because we work in data quality and MDM. Most people don't know, I'm 15 years old, um, and you can believe that um, if, uh, if you want. Um, so, <laughs> Aaron is right. We had a bit of fun, uh, Sam, myself, and Aaron putting together this scenario. But actually, a lot of it's actually um, inspired by the customers that we work with. Um, and in this particular case, I'd like to introduce you to a company called Merlin Properties. And you know, like a lot of other property managers in the UK, they they kind of manage a whole suite of uh, different properties. In fact, in this example, Merlin Properties they have over you know, roughly 3,000 properties that they manage. And from an outsider's perspective, property management, wow, that looks so easy to do. All they need to do is manage their properties and their contractors. And I really love this, um, this, this uh, set of words that uh, Aaron used was this golden thread, which is as you pull on that thread of data, you realize there's this whole complexity behind it. There's this whole web of interconnected data behind it that makes it so complex for these kind of um, companies and industries to actually manage their data. And you can imagine, okay, so uh, contractors, they have subcontractors and subcontractors, and they have their own subcontractors, and they all have their employees as well. And all of those employees, they need to be certified and qualified to actually work on the properties. Right, um, Aaron used a great example of, I guess one of those topics that's often seen as, as like a not a value add, which is, yeah, but we might get fined, right? And, you know, in, in the UK specifically, this is one of the things that Merlin Properties is definitely thinking about in that 
because they don't feel like they've got a good grasp on their data management. Um, it, it, it's one of those things is, you know, just a single example of a breach of, we've accidentally put someone on a job that wasn't qualified to do it. These kind of, um, these are regulatory requirements. Um, for Merlin Properties, a couple of these examples, they'd be bankrupt. You have to realize that property management, the margins are very low, right? So, um, you know, a couple of these and Merlin Properties, they see this as a huge risk. But Aaron also kind of alluded to this idea of, well, a higher level of data quality for Merlin Properties would also yield um, some better operational uh, um, uh, examples as well. I mean, just examples that Merlin Properties have shared with us in this in this use case, um, accidentally putting the wrong contractor on the wrong job or accidentally putting multiple contractors on the same job because we don't have good data management in, in, in place. And let's um, exacerbate the situation in that we're in the construction industry, right? So in property management. So, you know, Merlin Properties have built their reputation of working with lots of different contractors, everyone from a two-person shop uh, all the way up to kind of these big uh, contracting firms. And you can imagine the kind of data they get um, sent to them to be able to, um, I guess, correlate this data. It's in all different formats. You know, your two-person shop might manage it in Excel. Um, you might have uh, bigger firms send SAP extracts and Merlin kind of have to somehow wrangle all of this heterogeneous data. It looks different. It relates to each other different. It's in different languages. Um, it has no standards. It has no centralized governance. And then you start to realize, well, a lot of industries are in this situation. Consumer goods is another one where I would just say, same challenge. Um, that kind of channel management problem of I've got I'm selling your product on all these different channels, but I'm I'm I'm, sh I'm giving you our data in all this different structure and formats. So um, lots of different problems, and really what Merlin Properties are asking for is I don't just need the golden record, I need the golden thread. In that, as I go and fix problems in my data, there's this impact that happens downstream. For example, if I was to identify, oops, we've got the same contractor twice, we realize that it's not just the contractor that's the problem, it's that web of data that sits behind it. And so when we fix the contractor, we need to know about what impact that has and how that relates to all that kind of connected thread that sits behind it. So Merlin Properties have asked, I need a connected view of my data. Right? I want the golden records but I also want that golden graph, that golden network of data. Now, let's not just talk about the pessimistic things, like we need to do this because we don't want to get fined. And that's fair. That is a very kind of defensive mechanism and use of data and MDM and data quality. But in this case, we've got Merlin Properties. They are commercially very successful in that um, they're managing 3,000 properties and they've got plenty of capital to go off and grow the business. In fact, the kind of leadership team has come together and said, I want 10,000 properties under management. I want that in five years. Um, unfortunately, uh, in this particular use case, um, an external auditor has come in, looked at their systems, looked at their data practices, looked at their operations and says, it's already buckling under the 2000. You're making mistakes. You're sending contract contractors to the wrong job. And I've got examples of you actually breaching this uh, these regulations as well. And so this has set this kind of shudder through the C-level where the CEO and the CIO have said, we can't actually grow until we've solved our data foundation, right? So there's a big problem, right? Um, but on the positive side, people are excited. If we get the golden thread, we can start to do all different ty types of things like I could simulate, you know, what contractors do we need on what jobs? I could even start to forecast, you know, where do we start to see all the properties coming up and what types of collocations will we need? Therefore, what types of contractors will we need to bring on 
as partners. So there's all these, besides the regulatory things, there's all these positive things that I guess more on the offensive side of data come in, where it's like more on the revenue adding, more on the, you know, uh, lowering of cost and always talking about risk. So we put together a scenario that kind of caters for all of these different types of situations. So with that in mind, and deal with me with my cough, sorry guys. Um, uh, this was a picture I took, by the way. Um, that was a lie uh, as well. Um, I'm not 15 and uh, that I didn't pay. I, I just updated Windows and now I've got these lovely uh, uh, mountains that I have. Didn't even ask for it. Windows just did it. Um, so um, here we have clued in. So Merlin Properties have decided to look at clued in to solve the problem. And um, clued in is a kind of cloud-based application, um, really friendly for end users. And this is the home screen. Now, if you've been involved in MDM projects before, you might be aware that some of the first things that you want to do in an MDM project is did you get IT involved? And then we start to model our data. This is one of the things that Sam was alluding to at the start, is that this is what makes Clued in different. Instead of having to you know, work with IT and figure out kind of what do we want this kind of perfect world to look like? What does that upfront data model look like? Instead, we're actually going to use the data to actually evolve and build a model along the way as we learn more about our data. And remember that uh, example before I gave where in the slides, I said, people are sending data through in all different types of formats. It doesn't look the same. It's not matching the same structure. And therefore the ability to kind of predict what's that end model going to look like. I think you could all kind of agree. It's kind of probably improbable, if not impossible for us to forecast. There's no way for us to know what's the next contract going to send us. And one of the analogies I like to use you know, Aaron mentioned fabric before. Obviously, one of the components in that is the uh, Synapse engineering. And that kind of, it's this kind of lake house approach to things where instead of kind of that classic data warehouse where we build a model up front and we fit all of our data in, the kind of Synapse engineering, the kind of spark, the kind of notebook approach is, no, 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 let's, um, let's, see, let's learn about our data along the way and let's make it really easy to adapt and change. And this is Clued-In's approach to MDM. And I think this is quite unique on the market. You don't really see this a lot um, with any other MDM. So with that in mind, I've uploaded some data across different domains. And let me talk you through the process of what Merlin did to get their solution solved. So they uploaded some data into Clued-In's staging environment. So, you know, very safe. We upload some data, we start to inspect it. And what we need to do is at Merlin, we need to map this data. We don't want to be talking about files and tables and CSV and parquet. We want to be talking about business domains like properties and employees and contractors. So as we upload the data to Clued-In, our job as end users of Clued-In is to say, let's turn this into a little bit more of like a business discussion. Um, I don't want people to be dealing with SAP and Dynamics and parquet and Delta and now, I want the business involved because they can look at the data and they can spot data quality issues that IT and engineering can't. So in this particular example, let's take a look first at the properties. And here, we've just got 25 rows of properties. And this data looks so innocent. It looks so innocent the first time we see it. And you can imagine, okay, people are sending us data on properties and contract all the time. And uh, I've never seen this data before. And this is really where the Cluding Copilot becomes in handy. Because as a business user, this is going to help me understand the data I'm looking at, but it's going to also help me do my actual job. So in this particular case, I've popped up my Copilot. I've got some data on the screen called properties.csv, and we can see there's IDs and addresses and cities and countries and things like this. So the Cluding Copilot, I can interact with it just like, you know, the ChatGPT or the Office 365 co-part. So I can say things like, uh, hey, I am on a webinar. Um, so let's keep things professional, please, right? So I've got that kind of banter with my co-pilot, but when I'm ready to ask it to do some, some things and, and ask it for help, um, 
that's where I can kind of start to interact with um, the, what we call the skills in, in, in Clued In. So imagine I'm looking at this data right here and I'm saying, hmm, now this is the first time I am time I am seeing this data. Can you tell me about this data set? And I love the nature of this communication because you can kind of you can kind of um, estimate what I'm wanting the system to do. I'm not wanting to talk about data in general. I'm wanting to talk about the data I'm looking at on the screen right now. And in fact, I'm wanting it to help me with what I need to do. And what the co-pilot has come back and, uh, and told me is, hey, um, let me tell you a little bit about the data we're looking at. Uh, it looks like we've got real estate data here. In fact, it looks like the property ID column could be used as a unique reference to reference these property IDs. Um, let me tell you about the um, different uh, columns. Um, let me tell you uh, things like um, we might be able to turn these particular values into what are called reference data values. And I can interrogate and chat with the copilot a little bit more about this. But in fact, it's kind of already given me the things I need to go on and do my job, which is to map this data. It's to change the discussion from files and tables into business objects. And before the webinar, I mapped this data into the concept of a property. Okay. So instead of serving out properties.csv and properties.xl and all the different data I'm getting, I want to serve properties out to the business. But what I want to do is I want to fix all the duplicates and data quality issues, and all of those things before I actually surface that out to the business. And just to give you an example of what I did here, I mapped this data and what I did is I um, selected that the property ID, that's a unique way to refer to these properties. And actually, you may have seen that before suggested in the copilot. It said property ID, that's unique. You can use it as a, a unique identifier. So that copilot is kind of helping me with what are often the tedious parts of MDM and data quality, mapping, detecting data quality rules, detecting duplicates, and things like this. So I've gone through and I mapped my properties, okay? Um, let's go take a look at another file. Just, um, we don't need to really look at one more. So let's take a look at our contractors. Same type of thing. We've got 26 uh, rows of, um, of data here. And what we've done is we've mapped this file into the concept of contractor. Same type of thing. We have um, uh, created the, it looks like the um, contractor ID has been detected as the identifier. But something interesting here, and this is something Aaron mentioned before, is there's actually relationships in this data as well. Um, in fact, if we go and take a look at the preview of the data, we can see a property ID. Well, that's obviously a reference to the property. We can see a contractor ID. Okay, well, that's referring to the contractor. And actually, if we go right over to the end, we can see there's a parent ID i.e. there's a subcontracting hierarchy that's happening here. So the data itself on the surface looks really kind of classic relational, classic do inner join your way to success in cardinality. And actually you'll find the truth as we look more into the data uh, is that this data is pretty low in quality. But at the surface, it looks fantastic. And by mapping this data into Clued In, what it's done is it has represented this data. Clued In has built a data model that looks like this. So this is looking at how all of the data actually fits together at a domain level. And we can see things here like the properties that we manage. We have contractors that are associated to it. Those contractors actually have a self loop in that there's this hierarchy that exists within the same domain. We've got employees that work for contractors. We've got certifications attached to employees. We've got certifications attached to qualifications. And we've got properties attached to qualifications as well. And what this web is showing me is that um, really without me doing any complex data modeling, there's this web of relationships that exist. And really the most important thing here for Merlin is I want to see that an employee 
is certified for a qualification for the property. That's the big thing that we want to, to figure out. And during that audit that we had, there was a particular record that was pulled out as having an issue. And it was this 890 Cedar Lane. So according to our auditors, we had employees that um, uh, were working on this that weren't allowed, they weren't qualified. And as we go and open this single golden record, so this record, this single view of 890 Cedar Lane, and we head to the relationships view, this is where we can start to pull on that thread, okay? This is where we can start to say, okay, well, it looks like we've got this contractor, PQR Renovations, they're attached to this property. And as I start to follow this thread, I can see, okay, so it looks like we've got some contractors for contractors. It also looks like we've got some employees as well, directly related to this uh, contractor PQR Renovations. And as I expand out this node a little bit more, so let's do that. So let's go here and expand that out. Um, we can see there's this certification here. And if I just turn my filter on here, let me highlight what is the big problem here. The big problem here, let me just pull this over into view is that if we actually study here and here, this is what I want to show here. So this is, this is the problem. Here we have a property that is connected to a qualification. And this, you can see the relationship that we have here as I zoom in. It's not a technical relationship. It's not one to many, many to one, many to many. It is a semantic relationship. We're describing that this property needs this qualification here, okay? This qualification is called Construction Industry Training Board. But what we can see clearly here is that Chloe is surely she's, she's certified, but she's certified and qualified for construction site safety. So really what we're looking for is a graph where this and this are connected. <laughs> so this is a great example of exploring the data from a different view where we say, oh, wow, like I can see the clear disconnection right now. And the problem was before is that if we look at this data in a classic relational view, we would not be able to pick these kind of things up. So that's an example of an audit. Okay, great, we have now can show those things. Let's go ahead and fix these things, right? So there's a couple of things we can do here. First of all, um, let's go back and take a look at the data that at the start looked so innocent. We had a list of properties and Merlin properties, they thought they had great data management practices. They thought, oh, it's all, of, it's all the contractors, it's not us. But actually, when we look at the property management, we can see things like this. Here is um, a property, 123 Main Street. As we go down, okay, what's this one? What's this one? Different ID. Oh, that is kind of the same address. The postal code is kind of different. It's slightly different. There's some formatting issues in it. But maybe actually this is the same property. And what we can do with this is we can set up including these deduplication projects and they're way to find possible matches, possible matches and duplicates in data. And in this particular example, I've set up a deduplication project and I've set up my matching rules. And these matching rules um, support everything from deterministic, probabilistic, and uh, we also use our graph and the use of large language models to do this as well. In this case, I've set up a pretty simple example, which just says, listen, um, where the address has about a 60% similarity, and I've also checked this little box down here that says, hey, can you take care of all the obvious things like street and ST? Just You can treat those as the same. Road and RD, please treat those as the same. Don't take those into consideration when you're comparing it. And what that has done is it's brought back a list of results 
And that in my example that I found before, just manually looking through the data, I say, okay, it's found multiple properties that um, all look to be the same address, but have different property IDs. And to demonstrate that this is not just about golden records, and it's more about golden threads, is that this is another way to visualize the data that sits behind Puya. This is that hyper-connected graph. Um, and if I just um, pull this view over here, let me just highlight the colors and what they mean. So over here, the orange records represent the properties. The uh, blue represent the contractors and the employees are green. And you can kind of see, okay, um, from a property perspective, um, let's take, what's a good one here? Let's take these two properties over here, right? You can imagine if they're the, if it turns out they're the same properties, the problem is not just with figure, fixing those records, but as I pull on this record, you can see that like it pulls this thread of data with it, right? And as we fix these records, we have to realize there's this impact that happens to all the records that are actually directly connected to it. And if I do something like that on a contractor, so let's do a contractor like this, as we pull the thread, I thought this was a great way to visualize that like there's data connected, not just directly, but indirectly as well. So kind of um, maybe take a little bit of a note here. You've got, okay, a nice, a nice kind of spread of orange nodes here. You've got a nice spread of blue nodes here. Um, and what we're gonna realize soon is, wow, this data is full of duplicate contractors and full of uh, duplicate properties. And as we fix these things, you'll see this graph fundamentally change. And you can imagine every insight we're delivering off this data is skewed by the fact that we actually don't have a good hold uh, on managing this data in the first place. So I guess to show the most impact, let's go ahead, let's open up these properties. And I'm just gonna take all the properties. I'm gonna approve all of them to be merged together. And then I'm gonna highlight them all and I'm going to merge them. When I do this, um, it's going to take those records. It's going to do the analysis, say, right, let's merge those records together. But what Cludin does very uniquely is it works out all of that web behind it that says, well, like I'm also going to analyze all that golden thread to figure out what needs to also change links and update links and things like this. And taking a traditional approach to this, this is a three month job. This is a six month job. Um, to do this. So this is the power of using graph to model your data in MDM. I think to exacerbate the situation a little bit more, let's go also and take a look at these contractors. Okay. So if we take a look at our contractors, we put similar types of matching rules here where we're checking phone number and name of contractor and things like this. And it's brought back, it's brought back a whole list of possible duplicate records um, you know, storing the same contractor multiple times, just in different variations. Let me once again, just, you know, to save time, let's approve, let's assume all of those are actually duplicates. Let's go ahead and approve them. And let's go ahead and merge those records as well. And so it feels like, oh, I'm sure things won't dramatically change. We just merged a couple of uh, properties and a couple of contractors, but it's that the key thing here is, that it's not just about the individual records, it's about that impact analysis to the entire graph. So while that's finishing merging, I can see a notification that says that um, my, um, my uh, first project for properties has finished. And um, as we go and take a look at the data, um, we saw that those, there were those addresses and they were kind of slightly different. And apart from fixing those duplicates, we probably also wanna go ahead and actually clean that data as well. Half the time, uh, the problem is finding out where those problems already exist. And there's a couple of ways to solve this. First of all, Cludin has a cleaning application, a data stewarding environment. We call it Cludin Clean. And think of this as kind of like a safe space for data stewards, those domain experts, to play around in an environment where we don't want them to be a coder. 
We don't want them to write SQL or Python. We want them to be able to look at contractors and say, you can't code your way to that solution. You have to know something in my head. Like those contractors are actually the same and they just, you know, change their names every now and then. But that's definitely the same contractor. And this environment here as I launch, <coughs> as I launch into it, this not only helps me identify the issue, but it helps me make a suggestion how to fix it as well. So let's take a look at like that property address that we saw before. And let's use one of the pieces of functionality that goes through and starts to make suggestions for me. Um, an example could be, in this case, it's clearly picked up. It thinks all of these variations of 123 Main Street should probably be this. And then it asks the human data steward behind it, do you agree with this? Now, obviously, in this case, I would say, yep, that's uh, all good. Uh, let's uh, merge those results together and let's close. We might want to fix a couple of these other fields as well. Um, if we try this on City as an example, I'm sure there's probably examples here of bad data as well. Just silly sick examples like this, but yes, all of these should actually be London. Let's go ahead and do that as well. Now, once we've had you know, a little bit of fun with cleaning the data um, and we're ready to persist our changes back, one of the most important things that Clugin does here is it says, hold on, this checkbox here is so important. It says, what you told me is actually very deterministic in nature, in that, um, you know, um, you said if the value is London with three O's, turn it into that beautiful looking London, right? The normalized and standardized version. So as we go and kind of make these changes back, what Clutin's going to do now is it's obviously going to make those fixes. Any downstream consumer is going to benefit from that. But actually, it's also going to generate these very deterministic rules for me. So let's take a look at that London example, where here, pretty much easy to understand by most business users would be where the city equals this bad version of London or this bad version of London. I've set up an automatic transformation to turn the city back into this nice version of London. OK, OK, that's nice. Um, but what? let's make it a little bit more tricky. So let's introduce kind of like, where's the co-pilot going to help me out with? So let's head over, let's take a look at our data dictionary here, and I'm gonna look for that property city element. And um, let's go look at all the different values um, that we have here. So here we've got some kind of, you know, for anyone in the UK, uh, you'll recognize all of these, um, um, cities. Uh, let's make this a little bit harder. Let's go to Belfast and let's open this record. And I'm going to change this to a really silly example. I'm going to change this to Hogwarts. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because how on earth are you going to pick this up? It looks like a city. How are you going to pick that up? And that's where the large language model comes in. So imagine now I go back to my city. Let's go take a look at this. And there's Hogwarts standing out like a sore thumb. It's obvious to us that imagine this buried in thousands and thousands of cities. I can bring up my co-pilot and I can say, I need help. Um, what do I want to say? Um, can you detect any anomalies uh, in this vocabulary key I've got here. And once again, I want to highlight the value of that this. Like, I don't need to actually give it the data. It's it's in the context of the what the what the actual end user is doing. And obviously, what I'm wanting to pick up is London's good. Uh, Birmingham's good, uh, but this uh, Hogwarts, that looks a little bit odd, right? And so you can see it there in the kind of co-pilot, it's detecting that, um, you know, particular skill it should activate. It comes back and says Hogwarts. And, you know, that is where the value of like the large language models comes in. It's those 
problems in MDM and data quality that can't be solved with deterministic or probabilistic techniques. It's that heuristic technique of I need somewhat a model. I need a huge database to help me with these types of things. Okay, so we have uh, onboarded data. We've built this beautiful connected model. We've got our golden thread. We've shown how we can set up and deduplicate records. We've shown how we can detect data quality issues, suggest fixes. And we've also shown how we can use large language models that as a business user, um, you know, solve some of these complex challenges. Let me give you one more example. Imagine you're trying to set up a business rule. Hey, I want to detect, does this property have a proper postal code? Does this property, um, you know, have a, a, a proper VAT number associated with it? This is one of those things I always find ironic in data quality is that clued in, we really believe these types of systems, they need to be for the business. The biggest gap in the market is not more IT tools. The biggest gap in the market is I need Sarah who knows about our properties. I need her to come in and put her work here. Like I need her to come into the supply chain of data. And more often than not, we often give these users, these data stewards tools that say, you can set up all these amazing um, data quality checks. Uh, all you need to do is write your regular expression right there. And you, you, you just, like, I've been an engineer for 20 years. I have no idea how to write most regular expressions still. How on earth would we expect a domain expert to do this? And this is also where the copilot comes in handy. So imagine you're wanting to build something like a data quality rule, let's say something like this, and you're coming along and it's for a VAT number, right? So a, val a valid VAT number. And as you're going along, you're wanting to kind of detect, hey, where a particular value, let's just take anything here, matches a certain pattern. And here it says, oh, please put your regular expression. So you can imagine coming over to here and saying, what is the regex for a VAT number? And having that ability to say, here's the thing you should put in there, it's this gap that's being bridged. Whereas I would give people a lot of empathy before of why suddenly is MDM and data quality, why is that suddenly going to be implementable by the business? And these are just some of the reasons why there's this quantum leap that has happened in the data. I think here's where I'm going to end. Let's go over to our graph. It looked like this before. Blue nodes everywhere, orange nodes everywhere. Let's run this query again. And the good thing is this is recorded, is that I drive into my graph now, and maybe like on first view, it's hard to view, but there is a significant change here. There's not as many blue nodes, there's not as many orange nodes, and you can see it's still this hyper-connected graph. And the reason why is the way Cluden thinks about data is in a network. And so as we make changes to data, as we fix duplicates, we realize it's not just this record. There's this golden thread that we pull and we need to think about all of it as well. And what this has resulted in is that now Merlin Properties is feeling much more confident about their use of data. Um, they've got a good grasp from a regulatory perspective. At any moment, it's either easy for them to see where's that gap between qualifications of what the property needs and what the employees have. And um, you can imagine how this could be applied to your industry as well. Um, so I think I might yield back to Sam to kind of finish us off. Um, so let me stop sharing my screen for a second. <clears throat> And also, uh, as Sam alluded to before, happy to ask, uh, happy to answer any questions that there might be. But Sam, I'm going to make you the presenter. You should be able to uh, share your screen to kind of um, let people know about how they can get the software. Appreciate it. But I think just before we um, jump into that aspect, Aaron, did you have um, any questions? For Tim as he was running through that, really appreciate that as well, Tim. Thank you. Yeah, so it is as always Tim, quite comprehensive. So <clears throat> but the the thing I have right there, the the piece I have is obviously I work for Microsoft. Getting that data out and having 
that, that golden thread appearing in some way, maybe in fabric. So we can start using those codex kind of queries to actually build sort of machine learning algorithms, getting the data out into fabric and, and main, maintaining is it integrity. And I suppose part of that is well, linking it to data governance. How, how is that transferable outside? If, if you've had, um, if you had exposure to something like Azure Data Factory in the, micro, in the Microsoft world, you'll know there's these, in ADF, in Azure Data Factory, there's this concept of like sources and sinks and uh, including our sync, uh, we call export targets. And essentially they're, where do you want me to send this data? And, um, you know, as of um, 26th of March, I think it was at the Fabric event in Las Vegas, Pluton announced their one lake connector, which means actually now I can push this out to Fabric and I can push this out to, you know, AVLS Gen 2. Uh, I can push this out to things like Azure Event Hub, Azure Service Bus, and um, for all different types of reasons. Some are more like I need real-time streaming and some are more like it's going to land in a gold zone or it's going to land in, um, you know, some one of my zones within in, in the lake. The other way that's super interesting to interact with the data included in is to not move it. Um, and, you know, one of the luxuries of Fabric is in Synapse Engineering, you've got your notebooks. And, you know, one of the, I guess, the principles of, of Spark is that you want to run everything like in memory. You want to run it in Spark. So you don't want to have to call back to third party systems like Pluton to say, now give me this record, now give me this record. Um, if you'll kind of cast your your mind back to um, in the demo, we built up these business rules um, where we said, listen, if you've got this bad spelling of London, change it into this. Um, including we've got an SDK that just allows you to go grab all of those rules and then run it in your Spark jobs. Uh, and from an engineering perspective, that is pretty phenomenal um, in that you can get all the benefits of performance in Spark but you can have that bridge between business and IT where you can imagine a situation where IT gets a load of data and says, let me give it a go in, in Spark. And then with, just with this one line of code and, and pulling in the SDK, you know, a pick install up the top, um, you go, oh, and now apply the business's rules. That's pretty powerful. Um, but as regards to the data, yeah, the one lake connector is the best way to get it into Fabric. Thank you for the question, Aaron. I think one of the um, other questions that I had was, do you know the, and I think uh, Aaron, you might have alluded to it a little bit with your question in terms of getting the data out. Those um, relationships, I believe, uh, I think when we were catching up at different times, those relationships are being built and those connectors within the data. Um, are there any other ways that that can be utilized? I believe, um, I think you mentioned something about, you know, to build in a hierarchy and things like that, mm -hmm. or to be able to export it. Is, what, what does they look like um, within the Cluedian platform? Yeah, so I mean, that's a great example. So, you know, in, in the use case we are putting together here, um, you know, if we take a look at the graph that we built, um, it all looks nice and, and connected. But actually, when you start to look at some of the data from different views, such as our hierarchy viewer, in here, you'll cast your memory back to this, uh, the fact that we had this contractor parent ID where there was obviously some type of hierarchy that existed between contractors. And this could come from mergers and acquisitions. Uh, this could come from the fact of just partnerships that they have. And as we go and take a look at this same data, but not from a graph view, but from a hierarchical view, you can start to realize um, the complexity of this data. Um, and, you know, I think we're lucky enough at Clued in that um, if you go back to these kind of first principles of data, um, a graph is kind of like a super set way of representing your data. Uh, in that if someone says, hey, can I have that graph in a hierarchy? You say, yes, you can. They say, can I, can I get that in my SQL Server relational database? You go, yes, you can. Can I have that in MongoDB as a, a flat data? Yes, you can. And um, what that does is it offers this immense flexibility for actually representing your data in different ways, but also, you know, as you proliferate throughout the business, you're basically giving everyone the best possible chance of being able to reconstruct their project on the other side. Now, this might be a little bit too much detail, but 
I can't help get excited about it. Um, you know, like, I think I agree with, a, there's a certain part of the market I personally agree with on, um, on the concept of data mesh. And um, I think there's a, a bunch of Microsoft guys uh, that I find I really am on the same page with. Like, yes, I, I kind of agree um, with, with, with what you're saying as well. And one of this is the concepts of, um, you know, the best thing that came out in data mesh in my mind is this concept of data products. And um, I wouldn't say it's come from that, but it's been revitalized in some way in the market. And so, okay, that's fine. Um, and one of the things that comes from that is we're all going to go off and start building data products, but then at some point we're going to build them in isolation. We're going to build them independently, but at some point we're going to want to compose them. Like give me that data product, give me that data product and find the connections. And one of the things that Cluden is kind of set up for success with this is the thing we're spitting out, um, and isn't that an eloquent way of, of saying that? The, 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 the thing that we're actually projecting out to the business is that exact same thing. It is that exact thing. It is the, here are the business domains, and here is kind of a table that has all of the links to everything. And some would say, oh, so we spit out like a star schema. And I'm like, that's the best way to describe it if you are a data warehouse person. It's what we give out is a star schema, which just says, bunch of domains, bunch of pointers. And so that allows you to kind of not only reconstruct your the connections in your own data product, but then have these pointers to things where it's like, oh, where's that? Where is that? There's a pointer to it. And you go, oh, it's in that product over there we know nothing about. But once we start to bring them together, you've already got those connections. So I think it's a really bright world uh, future with, you know, if you if you embrace the idea of graph and MDM, you can start to see there's all these big benefits that come from it. Yeah, and I think really appreciate that answer. I think even just you've been able to pull that out um, so quickly, and I believe that this is something that you didn't have to create, right? Based on the connections and um, how you've mapped that data, including automatically generated this again, so powerful and the. The flexibility of the different types of use cases, like you mentioned, with so many different industries and verticals, um, but this, even just your HR data with some of our um, law firms that are using, um, law firm customers mm -hmm. that are using, including right now, right, it's incredibly mm -hmm. useful to be able to see, okay, where's the relationship, where is the mm -hmm. um, the org structure, and it can easily be populated, and then it can be also then exported right out of the business. Again, it's super powerful. Um, as I'm just rounding, if you can give me back. Um, present him out there. Could you just have a look on your side if any questions came directly to yourself, Tim? As Yeah, I'll take I, a couple. So, I mean, someone at least appreciated the Hogwarts example. And the thing <laughs> is, I'm doing that for my wife. Uh, she's the kind of person that like every, like I'll sneak down uh, at night and she's just secretly watching Harry Potter. And I'm like, again? <laughs> this is, so I'm doing that for her. Um, but uh, she says, can the model be trained to pick industry specific knowledge to detect anomalies? So the model that sits behind clued in is a bring your own model. And the model I plugged in was something called GPT 3.5 Turbo 16K, that's the, the window size uh, for tokens. And, you know, that's a nice, I mean, you can see it did a rather good job and um, it, it's, it's cheap. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very cheap. Uh, and so, Cluden supports all of the models that come from Azure OpenAI and Azure AI Studio. And as soon as we started to support Azure AI Studio, Azure AI Studio, um, you then start to bring in the Hugging Face and Databricks model and Llama and the GPTs and all of that. And you start to go, and not to mention in AI Studio, the best part is you can build your own models. And so it's hard for me to answer this in, in like a, a very like, um, I've got tons of experience with guaranteeing you this, but all I'll say is that the GPT models that we're using are just phenomenal at, at just knowing industries and specifics. And Sam brought up the best example where Cluden has an auto mapping feature that uses large language models to map this into this. And when you bring on an SAP system and you need to map it into this, that's where you go, that is unbelievable where you go, it's in German acronyms, and it's figured out that K-U-N-N-R is customer name in our model. 
and you start to realise this knows about industries, it knows about tools, it knows about data models. And so I would be safe to say even the GPT 3.5 models are probably, you know, in the case of MDM, you're going to get very, very far with it. And I'd, I'll concur with that, especially if you're leveraging uh, Azure uh, AI. The, the, we, we've mm -hmm. done, obviously, it's mostly my day job at the moment, Tim, uh, but we've mm -hmm. done some great standardization, categorization stuff just at, at, in volume around semi structured data and structured. Um, so we can do those things. It might need a little bit of tweaking, but usually it doesn't take a lot of time. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, so hours. Just for the last. <laughs> Just for the last uh, 30 seconds there, Tim, could you pass over so I can just share the last screen in terms of how people can um, get started with Colludian. So as one of the um, announcements that we actually made at the Fabric announce, uh, um, Fabric conference was being able to help people get started as quickly as possible by within um, um, using Colludian. So we're actually offering a free 10,000 records, uh, your first free um, 10,000 records for free. So be able to get clued in, install it within your own infrastructure or use um, a SaaS offering, right? To be able to actually just get started, whether you're working on, there's your contractors, your buildings, your HR data, whatever it may be, and really be able to test out the clued in, um, the power of clued in to be able to get insights within those six weeks. So feel free to um, go onto our website, um, www.cluding.com to be able, it should be there right there on our home screen to be able to, um, toggle through and navigate to be able to get that installed and really get started and more than happy to reach out to myself as well to be able to get started my information is there or just um reach out to um on our website as well and i really appreciate everyone being able to jump on today i know we went slightly over but for anybody still on really appreciate it and um, after the webinar is done i believe there's going to be a couple of questions that just pop up in terms of their questionnaire please um, answer those to really be able to um, help us out in the future. I really appreciate it, everyone, and have a good rest of your day. Bye -bye. Thanks, Hans. Thanks, Tim.